Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you here. My name is Jeff Ball, and I work at the Steyer Taylor Center for Energy Policy and Finance, which is a joint um, initiative of the law and business schools. Um, so Steve Camello, sitting in the back, is affiliated with the center. Um, and there are a number of folks at the business school and at the law school, and we happen to sit, I happen to sit at the law school. Um, but I just wanted to, I'm going to be very, very brief here, but I kind of want to frame this for you and then tell you a little bit about Chelsea, at least from my perspective. All good. Um, and then let Chelsea uh, take it away. Um, so this began uh, as, a, as, as a series of discussions that we had, sort of as an outgrowth of a project that we have going on at the Steyer Taylor Center, looking broadly at the relationship between the United States and China in clean energy and scaling up clean energy broadly defined, and more specifically at the solar energy industry in China. Happy to talk more about that at some point, but, but, but Chelsea and I had a number of discussions, and um, Chelsea's advisor on this thesis was Michael Wara, who's a professor at the law school uh, who teaches uh, energy and environmental law. And Chelsea also worked with Sergio Puig, who is head of the skills program uh, at, uh, at the law school. Um, and all, what I want to say about um, about this is that in, in, in these early discussions, I remember sitting outside with Chelsea at the law school, and we talked about this concept of what happens in Washington as sausage making. Um, and it was a, it, Chelsea sort of laughed then as she's laughing now, uh, not having heard the term. But the but the term obviously, well maybe not so obviously, has to do with how policy is made in Washington. And the notion is that sausage making is very messy. Um, that a lot of things are ground up, and that what ultimately uh, comes out of the sausage making machine doesn't often bear a lot of resemblance to the ingredients that went in. And so the, the, one, of the, one of the things that Chelsea then began to think about was how policy making in Beijing might be like sausage making. And, um, and I think to me this is the most interesting broad frame of what Chelsea's found is that at least to American eyes, this will not be a surprising conclusion to those of you who are from China or know a lot about policy making China, but to those of you who are sort of steeped in the American political system, I think there's a sense that what happens in China is very neat in terms of policy making. That Beijing articulates a policy goal and it simply happens. And there's a saying in China that Beijing is far and the mountains are high, which basically means that that's not the case, that, that actually Beijing can articulate a policy, but what comes out of that policy isn't always um, what was intended. And so I'd encourage you to think about what Chelsea's found as a study, yes, of the solar industry, but more broadly of policy making in China and how uh, what comes out of the sausage machine doesn't often look a lot like what went into it. And it's therefore a really interesting sort of real world study of how policy making happens in the country that I don't need to tell you is the largest energy consumer in the world and the largest carbon emitter in the world, in addition to being the most populous country on the planet. Um, and I, you know, again, just as a sort of primary proposition, in many cases, um, to the extent that the world deals with this question of clean energy, that question is going to be dealt with or not dealt with in China, full stop. Um, so, for all those reasons, I think what Chelsea's done is really interesting. I want to just tell you one other thing. Uh, about um, two other things completely about Chelsea. So Chelsea's going on from here to do something really exciting, which is Chelsea's going to um, Saudi Arabia and spending a couple of months in Saudi Arabia with an institute of the Saudi Arabian uh, government working on coal, which is a huge question to China, obviously, and the rest of the world. Um, and the last thing I want to say, and then I'll sit down, is that um, Chelsea is an extraordinarily dogged person. Chelsea began her experience at Stanford flying over here from London and talking to Dan Riker and me about her interest in in coming to the law school. Uh, Chelsea was practicing as a lawyer in London. And um, not long into this project, um, when winter break was upon her, she decided that if she didn't get on a plane and get to China and start talking to people in, in the service of research for this, she was going to have a tough time delivering this thesis on time. And so she got herself a ticket and got on a plane and went to Beijing and went elsewhere in China and just began interviewing people which is, I think, really, really resourceful. Um, and uh, there are many, many other examples of that resourcefulness throughout the past year. But anyway, um, that's a big part of what you're going to hear. And it's my pleasure to introduce Chelsea. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you very much for coming today, because I understand this week actually is exam week. So really appreciate your time to be here. So yeah, thanks very much for Jeff's introduction. 
And a little bit of introduction about myself, like I actually studied my, I'm, I'm a master's student from the Stanford Law School. And before that, I studied my undergraduate law degree uh, at London School of Economics and uh, Political Science. And then afterwards, I qualified as an English solicitor and worked in London, an international law firm, for four and a half years as an energy project finance lawyer. And that was the reason why I'm very interested in energy laws and policies. But, and the reason why I studied PV, the solar uh, photovoltaic, is because solar power has already become the third most important renewable energy sources in the world in terms of the installed capacity. So it's a very, very, it's, it's, it's growing very fast and it's very interesting. And it's also very important for the U.S. to understand the China's institutions of government, governance. Because uh, although the U.S. and China actually are comp competitive uh, business competitors, but it's also important that the U.S. and China see each other to, it's the interest to see each other to improve the energy efficiency as well as to increase the energy uh, security while reducing the environmental and economic impact of energy use. So that leads to today's topic of my presentation, which is how and oh sorry. Uh, okay, good. Yeah. So that leads to today's topic, which is how energy policies are made in China, a case study of China's solar PV institution of governance. And as I just as just now, as Jeff has mentioned, that I would like to use the sausage making machine as a metaphor to describe the institution of governance. Because if you hang around in the White House for a long time, you should always hear the statement that there's two things which you don't want to see that are being made. One is sausage, another is legislation. So basically, the sausage making and the law making have already become a, a metaphor uh, for a very long time. But I think this metaphor will be very useful to describe the Chinese policy making as well. Because later on, we will learn the ingredients that this machine puts in. And it also, if today's presentation is about studying the sausage making machine, is to understand the internal mechanism of this machine and also to know that how this machine works. So before we go on, can I have a show of hands on how many of you actually know a lot about the PV industry? Okay, and anyone know nothing about the PV industry? Okay. Apart from what I learned from you this year. All right, okay, then partly then. In that case, maybe it's useful to introduce a little bit of background information. Okay, this is the, this is the process of how PV panels are made. So what happened is here is this is the this is the polysilicon which is the raw materials used for making the PV panels, and afterwards the ingot is a big block of silicon, and afterwards the ingot will be cut into wafers. Wafers will then be assembled into cells. Cells will assemble into oh I was like click this one, uh, and then assemble into modules, and afterwards modules to panels. Finally, panels will be integrated to become arrows. And just like most of the industries, that the industry can be divided into upstream, midstream, and downstream. So upstream is the manufacturing of the polysilicon, ingot, and the wafer. And the midstream is the manufacturing of the cell, modules, panels, and arrows. And the downstream actually is the PV deployment, which means it's to use the panels, use the arrows to generate electricity. So from this, this, this actually this diagram shows that when the sun shines on the arrows, afterwards the, the electric, electrical current generated here is direct current, which is DC, and afterwards it will be converted into by an uh, inverter to become AC, alternate current, and then afterwards alternate current can be used for household directly or uploaded to the grid to, uh, to be transmitted. And it's also important to show that there are two main application methods for downstream. The first one, the first type, is the centralized on-grid large-scale PV generation, or short form is LSPV. So this another name for this type of application is called the utility-scale solar farms. They are usually located in the western desert area of China. And in the US, we also the US also has several utility scale. Uh, in the, the desert southwest. And um, by, by saying on-grade, 
here. When I say on grid, actually means it's connected with the transmission grid because most of them are actually in the western part of China and the electricity consumption actually is in the east part of China. So need, you usually need a very long distance transmission from west to China, west to east. And the second one is, I have just said, this is a distributed PV generation, or called DPV. Distributed, which means the, uh, the generation of the electricity is very near or at the point of consumption. So it's the opposite of centralized electricity generation. And there are two types of, two types of uh, DPV. One is called BAPV. It's called Building Attached PV. Or BIPV, Building Integrated PV. BAPV usually means like the ones that put on the rooftops, so that's an attached PV. While BIPV means it's, it's, it's like the part of the building, it's integrated into the building. And when I, when I have here like a, a bracket on on-grid and off-grid, what I meant is, uh, is that DPV can be connected to the local distribution uh, grid, or it can just be off-grid without connecting to any grid, and can be a stand-alone uh, power generation system. So, it's important that we let's look at a little bit about the China PV industry achievements and targets. China has very ambitious targets for renewables. For example, right now, uh, the current renewable development targets, like 15% energy consumption should come from the renewable energy sources by 2020. And the PV plays a very important part of this to achieve this target. That's the reason why the PV industry has recently been designated by the Chinese government as one of the seven strategic emerging industries. And thanks to a series of policies rolled out in uh, 2004, um, the manufacturing, PV manufacturing sector has developed very well. As you can see here that currently in 2013, seven out of the top 10 global PV manufacturers are currently based in China. And at the same time, the Chinese share of the global manufacturing capacity is 58%. So one country actually has 58% of the total world share. In terms of the installation, the deployment, uh, in the single year of 2013, 12 gigawatt was installed, which is almost the total amount of the uh, PV capacity in operation for the whole US. So that's only one year China installed that amount. And also, um, but China has more ambitious targets to go. So the recent target is 14 gigawatt for the single year of 2014. Amount of 14 gigawatt, 6 gigawatt should be the LSPV, and 8 gigawatt is the DPV. A lot of actually uh, Western commentators are very, very uh, dubious, uh, to very worried, concerned whether these targets will be able to be achieved. Because um, LSPV is easy to achieve, but DPV usually is more difficult to achieve the targets. But if the targets can be achieved, it seems like the China's total target of 35 gigawatt by 2015 will not be that difficult to achieve. Okay, enough about background. So today we are looking at how policies and the regulations are made in China's solar PV industry. By using the sausage making machine as an metaphor, my presentation tend to, is going to answer four questions. First, who? So which means who are the PV policymakers? So who is this master of sausage? Second, made what and when? So what kind of sausage have been made? So which means what kind of PV policies have been made? Four question, the third question is why? In other words, uh, what kind of ingredients that um, have been put into this uh, sausage making machine? And then finally, how? So how this sausage making machine is going to function and how policies are made in China. So we're going to look at who are the PV policymakers. And a prominent feature of the PV regulation system is this authority fragmentation. And this picture actually shows all the government agencies at the central government level actually are in charge of issuing laws and regulations in relation to the PV industry. As you can see, it's very much fragmented. And the most important one is to the NDRC, which is the uh, National Development Reform Commission. NDRC is the most important agency in charge of all the policies. Even within the NDRC, you can see that the responsibility is split between NEA, which is National Energy Authority, as well as NDRC Pricing Department. So the NEA is the second most important uh, uh, government agency in charge of the PV industry. 
But the NEA has its its ability is constrained because it doesn't have the authority to set energy prices. So as you can see, that the energy prices, such as the on-grid electricity prices, as well as the PV feeding tariffs, they are set by the NDRC pricing department. So without this this ability to set energy uh, policies, uh, energy prices, actually uh, the the authority of NEA is very much reduced. And also other ministries like uh, MIT, which is the Ministry of Information and uh, uh, Industry and Information Technology, Ministry of Science and Technology, Ministry of Housing and Urban Rural Development, as well as the Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Environmental Protection, they all each are responsible for uh, formulating certain specific PV industries. So it's very much fragmented, divided between different uh, government agencies. And all this, actually, all these um, government agencies are under the control of the State Council, which is the executive branch of the government. But the State Council is, um, is consulted by the National Energy Commission, which is a commission formed by, where is the line? Yeah, it's going to be formed by several heads of the ministry, so it's more of like a consultation commission. And uh, guided, of course, by the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. And then the National People's Congress is the legislature in China, which promulgated the Re Renewable Energy Law 2006, which has been amended in 2009. The Renewable Energy Law has been very helpful for the, the deployment of the PV because it has set out that mandatory connection obligations by the REA, by, by the law that the brick company has to purchase and pay for whatever the PV, uh, PV uh, electricity generators. And in addition to that, there's a vertical fragmentation between the provisional government as well as the central government. Here, the provisional DRCs, they are paid and staffed by the provisional government. Therefore, the relationship between the provisional DRC and the provisional government is a binding, uh, more of like a leadership relationship. It's, a, it's governed by binding orders. On the other hand, Actually, the relationship between the provisional DRC and the NDRC is a professional relation, so which means it's, it's governed by non-binding orders. So this causes problems because uh, provisional NDRCs are supposed to be the ears and eyes of NDRC. But however, because of this structure, it becomes uh, agent of local interest. So which means they become the agent, the local agent of the provisional government. So a lot of times, they are actually trying to cover for the local interest. A very good example is that a lot, some of the uh, provisional DRCs are approving, under the guidance of the provisional government, are approving, trying to approve some very small and low efficient PV, project, uh, PV generation projects. But they understand that actually they will be opposed by NDRC. Even that, they actually defy the NDRC, and also they just choose not to tell the NDRC what they have approved. So you can see that this, this, um, this structure of a central and provisional relationship is very much fragmented as well. So now we turn to the second question. So what are the policies and when they are made? It's very important to understand the PV development in the context of Chinese political development as well. As this picture, picture has shown that officially, the Chinese CCP has undergone five generations of leadership. The first generation, Mao Zedong, second generation, Deng Xiaoping, third generation, Jiang Zemin, and the fourth generation, uh, Hu Jintao, and the Premier, Wen Jiabao, and the current one, fifth generation, Xi Jinping, plus Premier Li Keqiang. The reason why I want to show you this is because the PV policies have only started in 1990s, which is not long after the Deng's ruling. It's very important because during the Mao's ruling, the Chinese economy is very much focused on self-reliance and as well as there's self-reliance and, and, and also there's not, not much of a market economy. And then actually was the one introduced the market economy and opened up the Chinese government and, uh, and also started the reform and opening up. So the PV development is very closely linked to the Chinese economic opening up um, background. So after studying the history of PV development, four stages of policy shifts can be identified. Stage one between 1990s and 2004, 
At that time, the PV industry and the PV market have not really been fully developed. At that time, there were only a few rural electrification projects in place to try to provide, to pro provide electricity to the poorest in the western part of China. Stage two is between 2004 and 2008. What happened is 2004, the uh, very favorable subsidies, uh, PV subsidies scheme introduced by Germany and Spain opened up an international PV market. So the Chinese PV manufacturers grasped the opportunity to start become a, a large-scale international industry. And then at that time, uh, most of the development policies actually are focused on the midstream, midstream, uh, midstream manufacturing policies. At that time, it's a stage of export-oriented manufacturing growth with 90 to 90 to 95 percentage of the production exported to other countries. So at that time, you can see it's, it's, it's very much focused on mystery. And stage three is between 2009 and 2011. It's what happened is the financial crisis in 2008 have made there's a shrinkage of the international PV market. And that was the reason the Chinese government realized we should not over rely on the export market and started to develop the domestic uh, market, PV market. And that was the reason why the, the, the policy had been shifted to focus on the downstream part of it, to try to stimulate domestic deployment. But at that time, most of the project, uh, PV project encouraged is the large scale on grey solar farms, which is the LSPV. And in stage four, what happened is that the, the, a, lot of the, a lot of the solar farms, actually, as I just introduced, that is in the western part of China. And there is a great constraint between transmission. There's great constraint of transmission system. So uh, the the government have realized that so maybe we need to start uh, develop more of focus more of the distributed PV generation. And also at the same time that because during this period of time and this time there are too much government supported investment boom, which caused a very huge oversupply problem. So the oversupply in the world PV manufacturer have driven down the world PV panel prices to a very low point, which makes a lot of US and EU manufacturers went bankrupt. So in 2012, the US and EU has conducted, has initiated the anti-dumping and anti-subsidiary investigation against Chinese PV manufacturers. And that was the reason um, in, 20, in, in 2012 and early 2013, it was the real winter for the PV manufacturers in China because a lot of the, because of this anti-dumping, anti-subsidiary, they all went bust. And it, it's also contributed to the Chinese government to step up the measures to stimu further stimulating the domestic deployment market to digest this oversupply, but with a focus to shift from LSPV to DPV. So after understanding this four stage of policy shifts, now let's look at why were these policies made. In other words, is that we're going to look at the factors constraining and driving the policy changes. In other words, that we're going to look at the ingredients which have been put into this sausage making machine. So these are the ingredients, a lot. But they are usually classified into a driving factors or constraining factors. So we will see how these factors will apply to this four stage of policy shifts. OK, before going on that, I want to point out that here these are the blue ones and there are black factors. The blue ones are the factors internal to the PV sector and the black ones are external to the Chinese PV sector. You will see that actually both external and internal factors will affect the policy shift in China. There are four findings actually you can, you can learn from all these factors. First finding is external factors such as world event, trend, as well as new technologies, new ideas, actually cause shifts in the underlying political ideologies of the top leadership. For example, the reason why China have opened up this PV manufacturing was under the influence of the multilateral governments such as World, Event, uh, sorry, World Bank. Uh, so basically, which means is in, 19, in 1990s, outside China, there is a lot of innovation going on which have reduced the prices for PV manufacturing technology. By that time, as I just mentioned, in stage one, there hasn't been any PV development at all. 
But in 1999, and then there's this uh, brightness program introduced an international effort trying to bring electricity to the rural areas worldwide. And because of this worldwide, uh, this worldwide effort trying to develop the uh, PV technology, and also under the influence of World Bank, as well as other governments such as Germany and Japan to try to actually uh, use all these technologies in China. So that makes the Chinese government start thinking about, huh, China, maybe PV generation might be a good way to solve the rural electrification problem in China as well. So that actually started the PV industry. So as you can see that this actually was very much influenced by the world event and then the, the new technology and new ideas. Second finding that internal factors such as frictions between institutions and the failure of old policies will drive the policy shift. Another example is a lot of problems actually uh, happened at the implementation of the Renewable Energy Law 2006, actually made a lot of, uh, so triggered the amendment in 2009. So you can see actually failure of old policies will become a driving force to push for the policy change. And then some other factors such as existing institution policies and failure of the new policies or energy infrastructure, infrastructure actually will become a constraining factors which will, will, will reduce the policy shift. A good example is that China is a very coal heavy industry. And most of the power plants owned by the five generation companies are still coal fired power plants. So that's the reason um, you still can see that the, the progress moving into green electricity is slow. Because once when the solar cuts into the annual minimum uh, generation quotation of the coal fire plants, it will become very complex and become very political. So, so there's this frictions between different institutions and different vested interests will actually make the, the transformation go very, very slowly. And also I want to point out there are some other uh, factors such as vested interests, vested interests as well as policies in other sectors can have both constraining and driving factors, especially policies in other sectors such as macroeconomic planning usually will have a huge impact on policy, uh, PV policy development as well because usually the industry policies will always have economic concerns. So, so many factors, what the takeaway point I want you to point out here from this slide is that this zigzag route, this zigzag route is inevitable because it, it will have to be influenced by a range of political and economic factors and also through policy experimentation and policy learning. And also adding to that, there hasn't been a unified uh, energy authority to regulate, to actually promulgate uh, in co a coherent national energy policy. So that's the reason why you see this, this is the exact thing. And that's what I want you to do. This is the, the takeaway point from this slide. So now we're going to look at how policies are made. There are four misconceptions of uh, Chinese uh, policy making from the Western countries, which I want to point out here. Misconception one, that China has a very strong central government. So this is our chairman, current chairman Xi, and so he's in his emperor, uh, emperor suit, so people assume that that's what happened in China. But actually the reality is no, because of decentralization. So as I have just announced by the third plenum of the uh, 18th party congress, that the central government is continued to decentralizing its power by decentralizing, what I meant is that the local government and the local officials will assume more power to stimulate local economic growth. In other ways, that the local government have more power and it will be very will be efficient for the bureaucracy in this way. But on the other hand, the central government actually will have weakened power. Well, the, the, the central government's authority has been weakened. So actually, I think a better way to describe it is more of a balance of power between the local government and the central government. So this, these are the local government, the one that holds the uh, uh, red blue is like local, and the one holding the yellow ones are like the, the central government. So on, on one hand, that on one hand that the, the local government have the pressure from the central government to trying to implement the policies. 
But on the other hand, it also has the pressure to stimulate local economic growth. So sometimes they choose to defy, so they choose not to obey the central government. So you, you would say actually, um, especially in the PV industry, it's very much in this way because um, PV industry is uh, an industry where, where the local government involved heavily with the uh, manufacturing sector by directly investing into the PV manufacturers. So a lot of time you see the local government just disobey what the central government do because they want to increase the GDP growth and that's more important for their performance evaluation for the local government to be promoting the second ranking. So in all other ways, uh, actually, it's not a strong central government. It's actually the central government has increasing weaker control of the local government. Second misconception that China is a powerful authoritarian party state, and that's the, the CCP emblem. The reality is not really, not, not entirely true. What happened is the, the, the common way of uh, policy making in China is finding consensus. Finding consensus, the, the most important means to achieve consensus is through bargaining. Bargaining is very messy because it happens not only between central government and local government, it also happens in localities and bureaucracies at different stage. So because of the authority fragmentation, the, uh, 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 the, the government agencies, they always have their own vested interests to protect. And then there is also the existence of veto players, which are the political actors which have the power to block the consensus to be made. They have power to say no to some of the policy decisions. And the more issues, if the issue is more, if the issue is more contentious, then there will be more vested interests involved, and there will be more veto players. So once when there is this consensus cannot be achieved, what happens is that this decision will be kicked up to a higher level of leadership to make a decision on this policy. If this is not solved, it will be further kicked up to the top leadership. So in other words, the central government is actually adopts a management by exception. So which means if the lower level will be able to achieve consensus, the central government is happy to relinquish its control over the decision making. They will allow this decision to be made by the lower uh, lower level of bureaucracy. But the lower bureaucracy, they usually do not have the national interest in mind. They always just try to protect their own thing. So in other ways, you can see that this, this, this conflict of a, a, a consensus building, it's not really shows a powerful authoritarian party state, which means like command and control, and the central government just tells the local government. And a lot of time it's really just the lower government making consensus on most of the decision making. Misconception three, top-down decision making. So in China, most of decision making actually is uh, gone through three phases. Phase one is agenda setting by the top leadership. Phase two is the choice of uh, policy tools by the ministries. And then phase three is the implementation by the local government. A lot of scholars have identified this top-down model However, this is not the entire picture because a lot of times you see, I think the better representation is this. This is a circular iterative policy processes because a lot of time problems happening here in the implementation problems actually will influence or sometimes trigger the agenda setting in China. And I just now have just uh, explained that uh, in China, like the PV deployment markets, is very much triggered by the local government and the manufacturers. So this circular, iterative, agenda, bottom-up agenda setting process actually shows that the central government not necessarily always know what he wants or go and get what he wants. It's a very much like a lot of the a lot of the agenda setting is prompt or actually under the influence of the impact of the local governments as well as the implementation of the policies. So the fourth misconception that decision making of uh, the policy decision making actually by a few elites. It's actually true that in the first and second leadership generation, the CCP leadership, it was true that there were only a few uh, actors or institutions actually be able to input into this agenda setting process, but this is not anymore since the third leadership. Nowadays, 
Nowadays, you will see that when China interacts with the global economy, actually there are a lot of other NGOs or international environmental protection, they also actually involved in the policy making in the energy sectors. They're good, their input is good that to make the policy uh, uh, making process very consultative and very participatory, but also at the same time, it makes the whole process lengthened and iterative. And sometimes, if consensus cannot be achieved, as I just mentioned, because there are too many involvement of the stakeholders, no decision is always the norm. So that's actually it's a misconception that actually nowadays you see that more people involved with, with the decision. So we can summarize four principles how this sausage making machine works. First principle is that the underlying political ideologies of the top leadership provides the overarching directions of the PU policy development, but the but on the other hand, that the policy uh, the political ideologies are heavily influenced by world external factors as well as the bottom up agenda setting process. Second, that the internal institutional changing force for policy making is through, still through policy experimentation and policy learning. By policy experimentation, which means that in China, it's very much they always implement a pilot project. So for example, the PV deployment uh, project program, for example, the solar, uh, the golden sun, as well as the solar roofs, they are usually started as a demonstration program. So once when this demonstration program has become successful, and then it will be scaled up to more of a nationwide implementation. So that's very much a policy experimentation. And policy learning, as I've just said, like a lot of times that the new policies were made because of discovering problems, find out from the old policies. So it's a, a, it's a, a process of keep changing the policies to learn from what, what, what went the, uh, along the way. And the third is that contributes to the third principle, which is gradualism in reform. So by gradualism means that the changes are introduced in an experimentally, gradually, and stemming from the pre-existing policies set up very slowly. A lot of my interviewees, like for my research, have told me that the transformation of uh, uh, institutions and policies in the Chinese energy sector is very slow and very gradual and incomplete. And that's that's remain in that way because, as I just said, the the, the try, they have to always trying to reach consensus. It's always when it's more contentious, it's always more difficult to reach consensus. The fourth principle is it's important that to the, the Chinese government's emphasis on development goals is it helps to explain the uniqueness of the policy making in China. Because um, the political legitimacy and the stability is always pursued as the ultimate goal of the CCP. And that's what happens that the pursuit of economic growth is always pursued as the mean to make sure to pacify the, the rising middle class uh, in, in China and trying to make sure that the social stability and to make sure that the CCP still continues to have its political legitimacy. And that's why you will see, especially in the PV uh, development, like the development of the PV domestic market to save all these PV manufacturers, is really trying to uh, make sure there's no social stability in the country because so many PV manufacturers are bankrupt and this will cause a lot of social instability and a lot of people will lose jobs as well. So that's why the Chinese government put it as like first priority have to develop this domestic PV market to digest this oversupply to solve all these failing uh, manufacturers. So that actually very much uh, explains that the, they're trying to pursue development goals to ensure political legitimacy and stability. So what I've done today is that this is a case study of China's institution of PV energy governance. What we have looked at is who did what and when and why. And we also, and that actually helps to answer the question how the policies are made. And this will actually contribute to answering the question how are energy policies and the regulations generally made in China. Nevertheless, that I have to acknowledge there are some research limitations that this is a single case study, so it offers adequate basis for you to for, for us to uh, understand the, the relationship between factors, but not necessarily have a, a valid or adequate basis to 
to really understand the cause and the effect. And I also have only started the uh, limited ingredients, so um, apparently I'm sure that there were more ingredients or more factors contributing to the policy making, and then further research can be done on that. And nevertheless, that this case study helps to understand, contributes to the general over understanding of the Chinese energy governance. And maybe also the sausage making machine like, can be used to compare with other sausage making machines in other countries. But, it's, it's, it, but contrary to the common belief that China as a one party authority, the Chinese government has greater power or less constraints for policy making. I actually disagree with that. Actually, I think fundamentally the Chinese government, uh, the way Chinese government making decisions is no different from the Western democratic uh, countries. In all cases, it's really just through policy experimentation and policy learning along the way, subject to various external factors and also subject to competing vested interests within the institution. On that sense, actually, the Chinese government way of doing things is really no different from all the Western democratic countries. So, it's, as I just mentioned, it's important for the U.S. to understand China, and especially given there are so many misconceptions on the Chinese uh, governance, and that will make sure there's effective collaboration between the U.S. and China. To and 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 also more importantly, that there should be coordination for both countries to learn its own competitiveness and try to play its own strength. I think that's very much the Style Taylor's, um, which is the Style Taylor Center's objective, is to make sure that it's not to make China or, 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 or US to compete with each other. It's more of to, to find a way that each to learn to use their own strength and to make sure that they collaborate together and make a better future for the whole world. So thank you very much for today and uh, questions. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned that mm -hmm. sometimes international players seem to have some influence on this policy making. Yeah. Could you comment a little more on that? I mean, especially with PV, yeah. how much do you see international NGOs or other entities having an influence on that? That's a very good question. For example, I would like, um, yeah, because of the time, so I didn't really elaborate a lot on that. But one of the reasons, one of the concepts, for example, the international player have put into the brains of the central government is called uh, a low carbon leadership concept. What I mean by low carbon leadership is, is that China actually was, con uh, was considered that um, some other countries like US or uh, European countries, especially US, it's because of the internet or some certain specific technology which make the country suddenly grasp up to, to become the world leader. And China very much wants to become the world leader. And it is a Western idea that once when you grasp a certain technology, it will help you to actually jump over to become a world leader. And that's the reason why China see this renewable energy uh, chance to grasp this technology to become a world leader. And that's the reason why you can see China invest so much on this. And then that, as I said, that's a very much a Western idea to contribute to this low, low carbon leadership idea. Yeah. And also, also some other things like, for example, climate change is also another influence over the Chinese, Chinese uh, develop, the renewable development. Because of the, the influence of climate change, China has this worry that they have to maintain this reputation of being a, um, uh, uh, at least, you know, um, respect for this uh, climate change efforts. So it kind of, uh, kind of agreed with this cutting the emissions target objective. And then that's also one of the reasons pushes for the deployment, the heavy deployment of um, uh, renewable energy. So that's also another influence from the Western country. What, what about in terms of like specific policies? Like for example, China has a feeding tariff now. Mm -hmm. for sure. yeah. So how much do you think that was influenced by you know, foreign actors advising the government? Very much, because what happened nowadays, as I just said, is more consultative. It's very common that for China to form a working group to study a policy before it's being issued or implemented. So what happened is they usually have a delegation sent out to Germany, to US, 
to study the, the, the feeding tariffs in, in the US, in California, or in Germany, to understand their way of doing things and afterwards trying to apply in China. That's a very common way of forming a working group on this. And another example is the renewable energy law. Actually, the California contributed a lot on the renewable energy law in China. And I read an article that um, what happened is like um, they bring a, a delegation of Chinese. Uh, uh, in China, the, the law formulation process is usually they will ask two working groups to work on the same issue. And afterwards, the top leadership will compare that which working group will present a better way of, a better draft of the renewable energy law. So there's one working group formed by the NDRC and the NEA. So they actually came to California and studied the renewable energy uh, legislation in, in the California. And so a lot of the renewable energy law actually is very much influenced by the California way of doing things. And another, another working group was formed by the Tsinghua University. And, but uh, finally, the top leadership decided to adopt the NDRC uh, draft of the renewable energy law. So that's a very much detailed input from the Western countries. Yeah. Yeah. How much transparency is there in the policy making process? Well, I would say they won't be, uh, as I just said, like they also have to achieve consensus. So the way that they achieve consensus is always very political. And energy decisions is inherently political because what, it, what I mean by political is to allocate the, uh, there will be winners and losers. Someone will definitely win from the decision, someone will lose. So that's very messy politics. So I wouldn't say that is absolutely transparent, but I think it's improving. It's much better than the old days, as I said. In the old days, they were very focused on um, planned economy, very focused on self-reliance. So uh, very few uh, players actually uh, devising the policy making. But now you have so many stakeholders, it just, it just become like really, it's more participatory and more transparent. But I won't say it's, it's there yet. Yeah. Yeah. So I was fascinated by what you said about the five major companies that yep. are the um, coal producers yep. for the for the basis of the um, kind of electricity grid in the mm -hmm. country. Um, and I wonder, first of all, are there any incentives for the coal producers to scale back and help shift towards PV? Do they and do those coal producers have any stake in PV at all? Do they have, for example, like subsidiary you know stakes in PV? And then the third piece of that that came to mind was are there incentives at the consumer level that would help to put pressure on the coal producers to shift over to PV? I would say maybe on the consumer level would be less because mm -hmm. uh, I guess the Chinese consumer really the electricity price is, de it is de designed by the, the government so they, they don't really have much say of like I want green electricity, I don't want that electricity, as long as I have electricity. Mm -hmm. So I think the major efforts actually come from the top leadership. So as I mentioned, that renewable energy has uh, uh, some kind of like a, a mandatory connection uh, obligation for the brick company to upload or transmit the, the PV generation. Also, on the other hand, that there are only five generation companies in China because it's, it's, it's still a, a, a totally state-owned um, sector. And even the five generation company, they actually, they were divided into five, but they're still like, kind of like a, a SOE, state-owned enterprises. So they also have the obligation under the uh, top leadership to acquire or have to um, invest into renewables energies. So they each actually have a portfolio of uh, solar or wind because it's they, the government said, like, you have to do it. If you don't do it, you know, we are not going to let your uh, uh, coal power plant run. So in a way, that's the, it's more of like forcefully that they, they have to actually you know, uh, develop the renewable energy. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. I was very interested by the statement that you made, such mm -hmm. that the way that China develops and influences policy is normally really not much different from the way that Western mm -hmm. democracies do. <laughs> Given that the Chinese political system is inherently different in some ways, mm -hmm. do you see any differences at all between the way that China formulates its policy in terms of energy, solar energy in particular, and the way that Western uh, countries? Yes, there are definitely differences. The reason I say it's um, not that much difference is fundamentally not different because it's policy experimentation, policy learning. But there are differences of socialism. Socialism still plays an important role in the uh, Chinese energy sector. 
what I mean by socialism actually really just means public ownership. So the, the difference between the generation company, for example, in the US, is very much privatized. The generation companies, they're all privately owned companies. But in China, they would never ever allow the whole generation sector to be completely privatized. And then this public ownership actually also has some, some kind of uh, input into this. It's like they are publicly owned, but at the same time, they still want the market economy to play it. So there's this kind of like a special, it's, it's kind of like a reform, but not complete. So it's called uh, SME, called like a socialist market economy. So which means it's, 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 it's the government will have ultimate control of the, the sector, but within the sector, they hope there's more uh, competition and market economy to be to be inside. But as I said, it's, I don't think the CCP will ever let the generation, the energy sector, to be completely privatized. I think that's a major difference. Yeah. Yeah. We talk more about the piloting process. How, how does it work? Okay, um, yeah, piloting process, what I meant is that it's a, a combination of target control and pilot, uh, pilot experimentation. So what I meant is, that's the way that China, how it implements the policies. It's first the top leadership will set a total target. As I said, 35 gigawatt by uh, 2015 total target. And usually these are set in the five year plan, the China's five year plan. And afterwards, this target, total target will be divided into smaller targets, allocated to different provinces. So every province will have their own target to achieve. And then on top of that, they will start to have some demonstration programs to kind of like, you will say like to lead this, this trend. Like for example, DPV, the distributed PV uh, power generation, Currently, there's 18 demonstration programs currently uh, in, in, in place in China. The, the, the good point about the um, uh, pilot programs is that it will allow policy adjustment because they will allow the small things to, to run first and so they will like really monitor and to see how this policy goes on. If this is good, and then they will completely scale up. Like Just like also carbon, uh, carbon prices as well. There are a few provinces in China actually have carbon prices and have started this carbon emissions trading, but not the whole entire country. They will always let the few provinces a small uh, scale to run first and afterwards and then distribute it to the whole country. And that's actually, it's, 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 it's kind of have both sides. It's good that in this ways that you will see that, uh, make sure that it goes according to plan and make sure there's a, a flexibility to adjust the policy. But there's also a bad things that you will never ever see a dramatic transformation. And sometimes if there are too many stakeholders involved and the, the pilot program might be killed and it will, the national program will never actually become a reality uh, finally. So, yeah. so I have one more yeah. question, which sure. is just sort of thinking out mm -hmm. beyond the rubric of the actual thesis itself. Mm -hmm. um, what about the market itself? And so you talked a little bit about the US as a um, PD competitor, mm -hmm. uh, and that it has misconceptions that are you know, backdated by five or more years. Mm -hmm. uh, what if so now you know these um, the, the PV industry leaders in the U.S. read your thesis, mm -hmm. think about how they want to write their misconceptions. What happens to the market? So okay. does it become more competitive in some way, or less competitive? Is it more? Is there more of a collaborative? process that's possible? That's a very good question. Actually, uh, what that's just my, my own opinion. Actually, I don't think that, I think the most important thing is for the both countries to understand what is their best strength in terms of the PV industry. So for example, the, 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 US, uh, uh, the US companies, they are very good with technology and innovation, and China is not good at it. So that's why you see most of the PV manufacturers in China concentrate on the midstream. Which is the, the where the where actually it's just simple assembly of the cells become modules become areas. It's it's more of like less in innovation technology involved. But while the U.S. companies actually are really good at in the in upstream, which is the uh, manufacturer of the raw materials, where most of the technology and innovation needs to be put in to make sure it's done. So I think the way in the future is really to 
think that China and the U.S. will work together not to compete each other on manufacturers. You know, that's why I actually I don't really think this anti-dumping trade dispute between U.S. and China actually will will be good for both countries, will hurt both countries. The better way really just maybe for the U.S. to divert most of the resources to really develop the technology to really focus on the upstream and then China does all the midstream manufacturing and that actually will be better for the whole world rather than you know both countries trying to really snatch the, the profit cake trying to get a slice of the cake out of this PV manufacturing this is not necessary and there are always like a bigger market and there's always collaboration between these two countries yeah. any other questions? if not then Maybe it's already 2.30, so I shouldn't have to like, keep dragging your time. And uh, thank you very much for today. And uh, please stay <laughs>